Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I am Howard Chan. I was on the civil engineering faculty at San Diego State for 40 years. I have achieved emeritus status because I'm retired. Although I'm retired, I'm still engaged on different kinds of activities, including the La Roche group. Well, not too long ago, I actually presented, made a presentation on Three Gorgeous Dam. You know, Three Gorgeous Dam, I may say, is the, is the largest modern engineering project in the history of mankind. Well, people may not know, Three Gorges Dam has the power generating capacity of 18 gigawatts. What does that mean? We may not have any idea, but one gigawatt is equivalent to the capacity of one nuclear power plant. So Three Gorges Dam has the capacity that is equivalent to 18 nuclear power plants. Well, anyway, Today I'm not going to talk about uh, hydropower. Today I'm going to talk about the Silk Road. Well, Silk Road, you may not have heard about that, but you may have heard recently, one belt, one road, that is being promoted by the Chinese government together with many other countries. Many other countries are also involved in the Silk Road or one belt, one road project. Okay, let us now start from the beginning. Well, Silk Road is a very ancient name. It goes back for, for over 2,000 years, just about at the time of the Christ, Silk Road started. It's a transportation route, land transportation route, between China and the Mideast, some of the Arab countries, it did not really go quite far into Europe. It did not go quite, go quite far into Turkey. It only went to Persia, as, as I remember. You can see the land route. You can see the land route on the map. Primarily, it was a land route. You know, that route, if you know the geography of the know, you know that is a very difficult route because it goes through the very sparsely populated Asia Central Asia, basically desert areas. Small population, therefore the travel was hazardous. I want to show you a picture. Well, this is a, uh, before I show you a picture, the Silk Road was then extended hundreds of years, gradually to the Mediterranean Sea. It actually reached the Roman Empire. This was a few years, a hundred, few hundred years later, after the initiation of the Silk Road. Okay, Persian Gulf and Mediterranean, as far as the Roman Empire. Well, I want to show you a picture. Caravan. The old transportation mode was by caravan of camels and horses. Well, of course, the transportation capacity or volume was very limited. Well, it goes through very difficult routes because Along the road, it goes through large areas with very dry weather, large desert. For example, this picture shows the background of that Taklamakan Desert, which is the second largest desert in the world after the Sahara. Think about the difficulty. Okay, well, not only difficult, <laughs> In transportation, it was also highly hazardous. Disease, you know, bandits, robbery, uh, these kind of things, they all happened historically along the road. Well, then, of course, time has changed. To this modern world, we have modern transportation means. But if you look at modern human history, the development of East and the West is basically by the sea road. You hear about the great powers of Great Britain, of Japan, of the United States. These are the sea powers. The transportation has by the sea road, by ships and boats. Well, we neglected the land route, well, until 
recent decades. We begin to pay attention to the land route. Of course, we still maintain the sea route. We are talking about the largest continent in the world, which is the Eurasian continent. That is the starting point of the One Belt and the One Road project. When China promotes the one, sea, one, one Belt, One Road, the One Belt actually means the land route. Not only the route, but also the bed, belt, the corridor, the corridor of land which will develop, which will grow associated with the development of transportation between East and the West. Let's remember, that is the largest continent, the Eurasian continent. The potential and the future is tremendous. OK, the, the Eurasian language, the, well, of course. The, the One Belt, One Road project promoted by China it includes the land road, that's quite a, called the one belt. The sea road, that is one road. They use the one belt, one road, okay, which is really extension of extension of the ancient Silk Road. Okay, uh, yeah, I said that al already. And then <laughs> let us look at the Eurasian land bridge. Well, the importance. It does not require me to say, because we are dealing with the largest continent, largest land mass in the world. Think about the population it, it covers. Think about the number of nations it covers. However, we are talking about a very diverse continent with all kinds of countries, all kinds of religions, all kinds of cultures. Of course, there's a lot of difficulties to overcome to realize the final goal of one belt, one route. Of course, the potential is there, the difficulties are there, the potential is definitely there, because we are talking about a huge population of the world, we are talking about so many countries of the world. Well, let's now take a look, the, the, the map showing the Eurasian continent. You know, the heavy lines, are the, what we call the one belt. They have identified six corridors for economic development. The heavy lines represent the six corridors, including most corridors in Asia, as well as the European corridor that goes all the way to cover the entire European continent. Okay, that's the one belt. And the one road, one road, you can also see the road going through the ocean along these continents, going starting from, East, uh, from China, going through Southeast Asia, but Maluka Strait, going through the tip of uh, India, uh, going through the Arabian Peninsula, going through East Africa, and reaching Europe, finally reaching uh, uh, Great Britain, by the way, uh, eventually, this is also going to reach North America. Well, somebody will also talk about the connection, extension of this one road, one belt, extending all the way from the Eurasian continent to North America, okay, at a later time. Okay, well, let's see, this map here shows two things. Some of the primary land route and the secondary land route. The heavy lines showing the primary land route. They goes from the Pacific Ocean, okay, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, including the Mediterranean Sea. Well, much of that is actually going through Central Asia. Central Asia, you know, there are so many republics, so many religions and so many countries connecting East and the West. You could say this could be the most ambitious, okay, connection for the largest continent in the world. Well, there are also some hub cities, you may say centers for economic growth. Well, these are the centers. They have identified major centers. This map shows all the major centers. At this time, they are concentrated uh, in the Eurasian continent. 
and eventually that can be extended not only to North America, in the recent development, even Australia have, has also expressed some interest. So in the final development, this can be extended to the entire world. Not only the land route, but also some of the economic centers for the, for the economic development of the world. Well, well let's see. <laughs> Everybody knows the Marshall Plan, which was so important for the reconstruction and economic development of Europe right after World War II. The Marshall Plan, okay? Well, Marshall Plan, of course, has rejuvenated Europe and also developed the economy of Europe, okay? Well, since China is promoting this project, they are also concerned about the political implications. They are definitely concerned about the political implications in this very complicated political world. They have made their official statement. I'll read the official statement to you. Uh, you can see it also on the screen. Uh, they, they stress that this is going to be no interference of the domestic affairs, domestic politics of the world, of all the countries, not only the member countries, but all countries of the world. They, they want to they make sure their intention is not to increase the sphere of influence in the world, okay? They, well, they're not striving for hegemony of the world. Of course, these, these are the concerns, I'm sure. When you're integrating those countries, you have economic influence of those countries, economic connection of those countries, people are concerned about these facts. Political influence and polit uh, hegemony uh, for the sake of world peace, uh, these facts must be stressed. Okay, but the big question is, for any development project, infrastructure project, it takes a lot of money. Where does the money come from? They have three principal sources for the financing of this aggressive, ambitious project. Okay, let me read this to you. The first mine is called Seal Road in, uh, Infrastructure Fund. Well, that was initiated by China. They put in the seed money in 4D billing. That's called Silk Road Infrastructure Fund. Okay, uh, that is, of course, basically uh, started by China. The second one is called Asian Infrastructure Investment F Bank. Well, this one is participated by many countries. For example, there's India, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Brunei, Cambodia, you name it. So many countries. That fund source has a financing at this time 100 billion. Okay, there's a third source of funding that is called is called NDB. That's also a development fund. Its headquarters is in Shanghai. That one, let's see, also has 100 billion. So do you see the funding source, the sources are already there. Those sources, for most of the sources, they are contributed by many countries. For example, England, the, I mean United Kingdom, contributed to AIIB fund from the very beginning. Uh, at this point in time, you know, United States is not a participant nor contributor to all the three funds. Japan is not a contributor to these funds, but many other countries are contributors to this important fund. This money is also being spent at this point in time. I keep hearing the news 
of projects, okay, projects financed, sponsored, okay, financed by these financial sources. Oh, I want to quote. I want to quote something to you. Oh, okay. You know, there's a there uh, there's a think tank. This gentleman, Kevin uh, Sneeder, he's one one of the think uh, think tanks. Okay, now. Um, he is a strong believer of this project. Uh, he said there were a lot of questions around whether this would happen. And uh, it is 100 billion, the funding of which China provides somewhere between one third and one half, depending how you look at it. Well, that's, that, that, that's happened. Is government still being debated? But interestingly, the government model seems to have become a bit more transparent, a bit more recognized by the European powers that are involved than had initially been expected. So you tick one box and say they are progress. The Silk Road Fund has also come into being. Um, and he is, we still like to see how it unfolds, but at this point in time, he feels optimistic. And from the news I, re uh, I read, the recent development, I'll show the whole thing is moving in the right direction. Okay, well, let's see. You know, uh, for economic, economic development, we need some major, we need some major economic development projects. And he feels this plan is like the Marshall Plan, except this plan is much bigger than the Marshall Plan, because Marshall Plan is only one twelfth of this plan, one built, one row project. You know, for economic development, I think we all recognize it's so important to have infrastructure major projects. If you look at the history of the United States, right after the Great Depression, how did we leave this country out of depression? And uh, to progress, to make progress in economic development that was during the Roosevelt era. He, well, he installed the United Spirit of Reclamation that builds hundreds and thousands of dams, reservoirs, hydropower plants, including the Hoover Dam. Grand Coulee Dam. That's how we lived in America out of depression. Well, that was a major development. After the Great Depression, after the recovery, there came World War II. After World War II, there came the Korean War. After the Korean War, there was another major infrastructure project. By what era? During the Eisenhower era. He proposed and implemented the interstate freeway system. That really helped to, to develop the economy of the United States. That was a major infrastructure development to connect East and West Coast by freeway, by the interstate freeway system. Okay, well then after the Vietnam War and <laughs> during the Clinton era, and we have figured out how to, to develop the U.S. economy, but the Clinton era coincides with the dot-com era. That's why the economy was good, and there was no federal deficit during the Clinton era, because his presidency coincides with the dot-com era. At this point in time, our economy is benefited very much by the fraction project. This country was a oil importing country that because of fraction, and because of fraction has changed this country, this country has become an oil exporting country. So these are the major projects which are responsible for the economic growth. But if you look at this One Belt, One Road project, this project is so gigantic, it's so many times the size of the Marshall Plan. Well, of course, <laughs> it takes such amount, large amount of money in funding for the implementation of the project. Okay, we still have to see. We have to see how the thing advances. 
We are talking about the land bridge, Eurasian land bridge. I want to show you a map. Europe is very well developed, especially Western Europe. See, this map shows the railway system, existing Euro, re, railway system for Europe. Those, those red lines are the high-speed train railroads. And uh, Europe is, of course, is highly developed, but you cannot say the same thing for other parts of the world. Well, this, this, this map is even better showing the, the, the system in Europe. And uh, now we are talking about connecting the Eurasian continent by railroad. That perhaps the most logical means for transportation, for land transportation, connecting the entire Eur Eurasian continent. And th this one shows the major routes, secondary routes. Well, they are by rail, okay? At current state of development, <laughs> you know, the, the railroad connection has started. Transportation has already started, but under the existing system, you know, train carrying large cargo has already gone from China all the way even to England. Many trans trips have made from China to Spain and also to Central Asia. But the system needs much improvement. For one thing, you know, the railroads, the railroads uh, on the Eurasian continent have different railroad gauges. Say, for example, China and Europe have the standard gauge, the railroad gauge, that is the distance separation between two railroads, is the standard gauge. Standard gauge is 1.435 meters. But going through Central Asia and Russia, they use the broad gauge. The broad gauge is 1.6 meters. So they are different. When you are connecting these two railroads, what do they do? Nowadays, either you move the, 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 the cargo from one, one, one train to the other, or you simply change the wheels as the trains going through from one country to the other. That's one difficulty they have overcome. Secondly, it takes a lot of international agreements because different countries have different taxation. Different countries have different transportation system. How do we move commodity from one country to the other? Well, to, to make it simple, make it quicker. Well, for one thing, the real, real gauge is one challenge, but I already know, I already know, in the future development, there's a future development of the high-speed train. The high-speed train, okay, will adopt the standard gauge throughout the world. By that time, of course, the situation will improve tremendously. Not only the standard gauge and the broad gauge, some of the countries have meter gauge. For example, Vietnam has meter gauge. Some of the hilly countries also have meter gauge. Now, until the real gauges are unified, okay, we are, we are trying to achieve that goal for the, for the, for the, uh, uh, to improve the transportation. The ocean transportation by cargo ships, they can carry so many containers. They can carry even thousands of containers in one large ship. The train capacity is much limited. However, in recent train development, each train can carry hundreds of containers because the train transportation has also improved. They have, all, they, have also, they have also signed and developed international agreements among the different countries along the road, such that those containers going from one country, going through all the countries, they don't have to go through the taxation system. They can lock the containers. They can go directly from one country through many countries into the final destiny without any checkpoints. So that saves a lot of time, saves a lot of taxation. But anyway, there's a lot of things to overcome, a lot of problems to overcome in the future. But let's look what has already happened. This is the new capital city, Astana, for Kazakhstan. 
Kazakhstan is a landlocked country so far away from all the oceans. Astana was a small country, small town <laughs> in the grassland of Kazakhstan in Central Asia, semi-desert area. But look what happened because of the prospect for this development. That city is growing like mad. Many things have already taken place. Okay, so people have moved in. They have built new buildings. They have developed new, uh, new industry, developed new business. So you can see the economic growth, the economic development in all the affected countries. Well, in fact, let me see. I have, I, I have the statistics. Look, we are compare. We, are, we like to compare water transportation and land transportation by rail. For the cargo ships, nowadays there are so many cargo ships going from Asia, East Asia to Western Europe, so many of them. For example, going from China to Germany, a cargo ship would take something about, let's see, about two months, that is 60 days. However, if you go from China to Germany by train under the existing system, which is not very efficient system, the time it takes is only 14 days. You can see the difference. And, uh, you know, uh, so it is quite apparent the advantages for this Eurasian bridge. Uh, this is the city of Astana. And, oh, in the future, in the future, there's no question. There's new development in technology, the high-speed train. High-speed train would more than double the, the current speed for the regular train. This is high train. High, uh, 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 right now, so many high-speed trains are being built, are being used throughout the world. And uh, there are so many railroads that are high-speed trains, railroads. They are building so many railroads, the high-speed railroads. High spin train would be the final solution, which will greatly shorten the distance. For example, for high speed train going from Beijing to Moscow, it would only take a few days, not in a month. Okay, so we can see the future is there. I can see this one road and from start of ancient time of Silk Road to the one Belt Rand Road holds tremendous progress, holds tremendous potential for the future of our world, okay? Uh, that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> if you have any question or later or right now. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Thank you very much. Sure.